If somebody asked you, what is the gospel? Would you know how to respond? We're going to talk about that today. Hey guys, and welcome back to God's Word Made Simple by Simple Servant Ministries. My name is Aaron Hawk, and if this is your first time joining us, I just want to welcome you and say that we're glad to have you here with us. God's Word Made Simple is an online discipleship ministry dedicated to helping you understand God's Word, apply it to your life, and grow in your relationship with the Lord. If you like this content, make sure and hit that subscribe button and turn that bell notification to all so that you don't miss any other videos that we put out. And we would love to have you as part of our family. Hey guys, and welcome back. So today we are talking about the question of what is the gospel? And, you know, a while back I recorded a video talking about this and I thought that I had uploaded it and apparently I didn't. So we're going to fix that today because I can't even find that original recording. So I'm just going to re-record this really quick. Um, You know, here's the deal. I I ask people um, from time to time in the various churches that I've served in, including the one that I'm in now, and I ask them, you know, what is the gospel, if somebody asked you, what is the gospel message? Would you know how to respond? Would you feel comfortable responding? And, you know, sadly, in my experience, most Christians don't know how to answer that question. And that's why there are so many things like the Roman road or the ABCs to salvation or things like that, little memorized things. You know, I don't know about you, but I have always struggled with those memorized systems. I am more of a conceptual thinker, not a a memorization sort of thinker. My wife is a memorization sort of thinker. So, you know, everybody's wired a little bit differently. So what I want to talk about today are the three different ways that you can share your faith or explain the gospel to somebody that wants to know. So the first way, and the most common, in my opinion, at least the most common that's taught in churches, I I don't know if it's really the most common that actually happens, but it's the most common that's taught in most churches, is a memorized system. And there are two that I want to cover with you today. One of them is called the Roman Road, and you can just Google Roman Road, Plan to Salvation, and you'll come up with all kinds of them, printable graphics, everything. It's a very popular one, but, you know, it essentially it walks you through the actual scriptures that you need to know um, to understand. So, you know, first is Romans 3.23, and it it says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So, essentially, we are all sinners by choice and by nature. So, the first thing is you have to admit that you're a sinner. You know, the second thing, Romans 6.23, and this is why it's called the Roman Road, because it's all in the book of Romans. So, Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And essentially, it's communicating that salvation is a free gift. And essentially, it's communicating that because we've sinned, we deserve punishment in hell. So, next up is Romans 10.9 through 10. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that He raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. So essentially, just believe that Jesus is who He said He is, that He can do what He said He can do. Right? And then most of the Roman roads offer what they call the prayer of salvation or a sinner's prayer, something like that. Now, it's very important to understand that there is, there's no magical formula to, to leading somebody to salvation, right? There's no magical formula to coming to salvation on the part of the one that, that is seeking out salvation, right? So the prayer, there's nothing magical about it. Don't treat that prayer as if it's some incantation that you have to get right or that there's a specific formula that must be followed. Um, the, the sinner's prayer, as, as it has become known, you know, it, it was created as a helpful tool to teach people how to share their faith and how to lead somebody to Christ. So it was crafted by humans as a way to describe a work that God is doing. And while that's appreciated, sometimes it's taken too far and people begin to get it confused and think that you have to do that in order to be saved. And The reality is it doesn't work like that. The reality is that salvation is when in your heart you realize that you have sinned, you deserve to be punished in hell, Jesus is the only way and you need to repent and believe in Him. That is essentially the gospel message. When you realize that in your heart, you are instantaneously saved. If you're asking for it, of course, you know, just understanding those things conceptually is not enough. But 
In other words, as we just read in Romans, you, the moment this happens in your heart, that's what I'm trying to say. It doesn't matter what your brain believes. It's the moment that this happens in the depths of your being where in, in, to the core of your being, you realize that apart from Christ, you are doomed to hell and it's just because you sin, that it is right that you will go to hell because you sinned. And in your heart, you know that he is the way to salvation and you want to trust him for salvation. When that happens in the core of your being, regardless of the words, when that happens in the core of your being, you are immediately saved. It's, it's not that there's some magical words that have to be said. Now, that said, you can read the sinner's prayer to somebody. It, it does help you as, as somebody that's maybe nervous about leading somebody else or somebody that's, that's a, trying to approach salvation, trying to approach the Lord, and they don't know what to say, then, hey, great, the, the prayer can help you by helping form your thoughts. But don't get confused. Reading the prayer is not a magical incantation to become saved. And I'm hitting that really hard because I've seen it treated that way. I don't know anybody that would consciously say that, you know, oh yes, that's, you know, I don't know anybody that would say that on a conscious level, but on a, on a um, practical level, it's taught as if it is. So the last thing is the assurance of salvation, and the Roman road puts this in there because there are going to be doubts. There are going to be times in your spiritual life that you struggle, as well as for somebody that isn't quite sure what's going on. And this is where I struggle with this one, because if that has genuinely happened in your heart, you're not going to have any doubt of what just happened. If that's happening in your head, you may have doubts. And, and I'm talking right now about immediately when you're going through this, right? The doubts that I was talking about a minute ago when I said you're going to have doubts at some point, that's later on in your walk, in your faith. You're, you're going to have times where you're going to doubt things, and that's okay. That's part of being human. But in that moment, that's, that's not realistically where you're doubting what's going on in your heart if you're actually being converted or saved. Uh, regenerated would be the theological word if you care for that. So Romans 10:13. For whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And that's the assurance. If you have genuinely called on the Lord, regardless of the words that you used, then it's done. You have been saved. So again, it is recognizing that you have sinned, um, recognizing that because of that sin, you deserve punishment in hell. It is understanding that Christ died to pay for our sins and that if we ask him and trust him, he will save us. And because of that, it is done. That is essentially the Roman road. So the ABCs of salvation is simply admit you have sinned, believe in Jesus, and confess that Jesus is Lord. And it's ABC, admit, believe, confess. And you know, I've, I've probably seen more churches use that one in recent history because it's so easy to remember. The Roman road, you have to memorize scriptures. The ABCs, there are scriptures that go with it. For example, for admitting you have sinned, you have Romans 3.23, which we already covered, and 6.23, which we already covered. And ideally, you would have this graphic with you. So you can Google ABCs of salvation. And there's a graphic there. Um, under believe in Jesus, it refers to John 640, if I'm reading that correctly. It's kind of blurry on my screen right now. Um, so believe in Jesus and then confess that he is Lord. And that's also from Romans. And that one's too blurry. I can't read it. But um, but when you're using the ABCs, you know, it's, it's really, that's usually a more conversational type of a conversation. So you need to know the scriptures to back this up. Um, but it's, it's very simple to remember, admit, believe, confess. And, and here's the thing, if you're, if you're at a point where you are leading somebody to the Lord, if you're a Christian and you're trying to lead somebody to the Lord, meaning that this conversation has taken a turn to the point that they're asking you, how do I become saved, right? It is ideal. It is important and ideal that you walk them through scripture to do that. But is it essential? No. And the reason I say that is because that's not the time for you to get bogged down going, well, you know, uh, let, me, let me go do some research and get back to you, right? That's where you can simply share from your experience, which is the, uh, one of the other methods of sharing your faith that I wanted to talk about.
So let's go right into that, right? The next method of sharing your faith is, it's what I'm gonna call the conceptual model. And it's the one that I use the most. And the reason I use it the most is because it fits my personality the best. Now, again, it's ideal that you have memorized scripture to back up what you're saying. Um, and as I have shared in other videos, I'm, and even earlier in this one, I'm terrible at memory. I, I, memorizing scripture as a, as a road memorization is is nearly impossible for me. It's very, very hard for me. I just don't do it well. What I do well is that I have been walking with the Lord long enough and I read his word constantly enough that I do have his word hidden in my heart. And in the moment that I need it, the spirit will bring a scripture to mind because I have done the hard work of hiding it away in my heart and my mind. So, I mean, not that God couldn't supernaturally do it otherwise. He could. So what I mean is that when you have hidden God's word in your heart, it is natural for the Holy Spirit to use that in your life as opposed to just supernaturally like uh, turning you into a puppet and speaking through you. Is that possible? Sure, but that's not the way that that relationship usually works. So the conceptual way is my preferred way of communicating the gospel. And when you're doing the conceptual method is, again, it's my preferred method of sharing the gospel. And the reason for that is, as I already said, one, I'm not great at memorizing lists. The second reason is every situation that I'm in when I'm talking with somebody, they are coming from a different place. Like some people are coming at the gospel as hardcore skeptics. Like they believe at, the, at that moment, they believe that the Bible was created by human beings just to keep other human beings in line. It was a government conspiracy just to keep the plebs in their place, so to speak. Um, some, you know, sometimes they're coming at it from a, a, a biblical understanding, right? They grew up in church. They have all the scripture verses memorized even better better than I do, but they don't have the heart behind it because they were just forced to memorize a bunch of stuff, but never make it real in their life. So, you know, you have a wide spectrum of, of the people that you might be talking with and where they're coming from. So if, if you have no other method available or you want to be as safe as possible, do the Roman road or the ABCs of salvation and memorize those scriptures that go with it. You can't go wrong with those in the generic sense. If somebody's genuinely ready to repent and receive the Lord, there's a degree to which it doesn't matter what uh, method you use, right? See, this is where I think a lot of Christians go wrong. And this is why I think a lot of people are afraid to share their faith. And this is why I think a lot of times when I ask that question of people, you know, how many of you are confident you know how to share the gospel with somebody? I, I almost never get hands up. Or if I do, a very small percentage of the crowd that is in the room at the point I ask that question. I think the reason for that is that we have been taught subconsciously or consciously to treat sharing the gospel like it's a sales pitch. And hey, I've been in business. If you wanna work a script and you wanna talk about sales tactics, buddy, I've got them. But that's not what sharing the gospel should be, right? You need to present information. You do need to challenge people so people go, well, see, you're, you're showing the benefits, et cetera, et cetera, and then you do your closing speech and you know seal the deal. Well. That's not your place, and frankly, that's denigrating the gospel. That is disrespectful to the gospel, and it creates a situation where people that would share their faith are panicking because they're scared that they're not going to remember the sales script. Guys, Jesus is not a product to be purchased, and your job in sharing the gospel is not to close a deal. Your job in sharing the gospel is to present the truth and let them deal with it between them and God. The moment we turn that into a sales pitch, you're not honoring God. So again, Jesus is not a product to be purchased, so we do not need to sell Jesus. Get that right. All right, back to the conceptual model. The reason that I like the conceptual model, as I've already shared, is because people are coming from such different directions when they come to that point that they're talking with me about salvation. 
So if I'm dealing with a skeptic, I'm probably going to start off, and, and again, I have the benefit of this because I'm, I have the education. Um, I have the biblical education as well as the time walking with the Lord. But if they're a skeptic, I'm going to start off with some form of apologetics, right? Demonstrating the truthfulness of Scripture as well as the reliability of Scripture. Because if they're a skeptic and they honestly believe, they've been taught or whatever, but they honestly believe that the Bible is not trustworthy, they're not going to believe anything else that I say from the Bible, right? So I'm going to approach it from that apologetic standpoint first. And if you aren't familiar with that word, apologetics simply means using logic to defend the faith. Um, so uh, Ravi, Va ah, I can't talk. Ravi Zacharias recently passed away. He's one of the greatest apologists that has lived in our time. I'm, I'm, I would argue probably the greatest apologist of our time, or at least the most commonly known. Um, so I don't know. There's, there's probably somebody out there that's better, but I don't know who that is. Um, but anyway, right? Apologetics is a, a using logic to defend the faith, and there is a good place for that. So if they're a skeptic, I'm going to approach it from the logic standpoint because their, their issue, their barrier, and that's part of it, is you, you, you need to figure out what is their barrier to entry. And I'm using sales talk, but it is not a sales system. It's just easier for me to word it that way and know that you know what I mean. So um, you need to figure out what is, what is their hang up? What is it that is preventing them, right? If their issue is that they don't believe that they have sinned, then you simply need to take the Bible, define what sin is, you can go to the Ten Commandments. Everybody's broken at least some of those, if not all of them, right? Besides that, the Bible actually says if you've broken one, you're as good as guilty as all, right? Because ultimately sin against, is against God. And that goes to the philosophical argument, which I use quite often as well, but I'll, I'll get back to that in a second, right? So if they're having trouble with the whole concept of sin, then define sin for them using Scripture and then talk, that's where you can go to that Roman road model, then talk about how the wages of sin is death and hell and all of that, and yes, hell and heaven are real, and talk about the great exchange where when, when we sin and Jesus saves us, He takes our sin and gives us His righteousness, right? Um, it's, it's very simple to talk through that. Um, you know, if they are kind of generically blind, and what I mean by that is they don't really know what's going on as far as what their hang-up is. Then I'm going to start with a philosophical argument or any of the other conceptual methods that I'm using, I'm going to end up using the philosophical argument at some point. And essentially here, and, and by the way, by, by saying philosophical, that doesn't mean it's not straight from Scripture right? It's, it's, it's more of a systematic or biblical theology, which I don't have time today to get into that, and I hope that I'm not overwhelming you. I am probably doing a terrible job. If you are new to the faith, I am probably overwhelming you with all of these words right now, and I don't mean to. Um, Essentially what I mean is I'm taking big concepts in Scripture and I'm boiling them down to simple truths. So again, I apologize for all the big words there. Um, if those make sense to you, great. But remember, I'm, I'm trying to help people that are newer to the faith and I'm doing a terrible job of it right now. Um, so anyway... Um, the, the conceptual or philosophical or the philosophical version of the conceptual argument. See, there I go again, right? It's simply saying, look... You've heard me say this before if you've watched many of my videos. God is infinite. I am a finite being. When I sin against God, I have an infinite sin, right? And uh, let, me, let me share this illustration. I'll, I'll share this with you just to help this make sense, right? So I'll share with people and I'll say, look, you know, if I were to walk down the street and punch some random person, what's going to happen to me? And, you know, there's any number of possibilities, right? They might shoot me if they're armed and dangerous. I might just get arrested. They call the police. I get arrested. They might punch me back or they might run away and nothing immediately or ever happens to me, right? There's a number of possibilities in there. Some of them, eh, not too bad. And some of them, you know, I don't want to get shot, right? Um, so if I just p punch Joe Blow on the street, there's any number of things that can happen. But what happens if I walk, and by the way, this is, I always qualify, this is not a political statement. I have said this across multiple administrations. So regardless of who is president, what happens if I walk up and I punch the president, right? 
if I even make it to the president, there's a decent chance that I'm going to be shot right there by the Secret Service or one of the snipers or whatever, right? I mean, there's a pretty good chance that I'm not going to make it out of that alive. Um, if I make it out alive, let's say they tackle me or something like that and arrest me, there's a decent chance I'm going to end up in a dark hole somewhere. Um, there's also the possibility that I would be charged with treason. And, you know, if, if someone were on the street and I punched them, let's say I just punched them one time and started walking away and then they shot me, right? Would that be justified on the street? Of course not, right? I mean, I didn't have a right to attack them, but if I'm already walking away, the threat is gone. They, they no longer have the right to shoot me legally, okay? So we understand that, but what about the president, right? Well, with the president, the issue there is that when I attack Joe Blow, I'm just attacking Joe Blow. If I attack the president, then what's actually going on there is I am attacking the United States. See, the president is a representative of the United States. He represents the U.S. So to attack the president is to attack the United States. And I'm going to end up on an NSA watch list by the time this video is done, I, I guarantee you. Um, so. The point is that when we sin against each other, that's bad. But when you sin against somebody of a higher status or somebody that represents something greater, then that sin is greater and therefore the punishment is greater, right? I mean, if somebody attacks the president, they kind of get what they deserve. And we all understand that because, again, that would be the same as attacking the U.S. So when it comes to God... God is infinite. He is perfect and he is infinite. So when I sin against him, I'm sinning against not only him personally, but I am sinning against his office, if you will. Well, that is an infinite being in an infinite office. His position is infinite, which means what is my sin? The punishment fits the crime. My sin is infinite. I am not infinite. I had a beginning, and the Bible teaches that, that my soul will last forever, but I'm not infinite. I will live forever now, but even if I spent the rest of my life, let's say I live a hundred years, and I spend the rest of my life not ever doing anything else bad, that sin that I committed at one point in time still carries on because it is an infinite sin against an infinite God. It's, it's a hard concept for us to understand because we don't understand eternity. But when we break it down, the Joe Blow versus the president thing, we can understand that. So all that is is going up to the next level and understanding uh, how that relates to sinning against a God, right? So I, I have a conversation similar to that. I, I've probably lost you at this point. But I have a conversation similar to that. And, and then I walk them through how God needed, if he wanted to save us, he didn't have to do anything. But if he wanted to save us, which he did, then an infinite payment was needed, right? Well, the only infinite payment is Jesus because Jesus is part of the Trinity, the Godhead. So Jesus is infinite. So in order for my infinite sin to be paid, I have to have an infinite payment, and that is Jesus' infinite payment for my sin, as well as I had to receive his infinite goodness, because just not doing bad isn't enough. To be in fellowship, I have to also be infinitely good. So there is that great exchange that happens, right? So you see how I use a, a, a philosophical big view argument from Scripture. Now that's still sort of apologetic in nature, but I'm, I'm, using, um, I'm using scripture and philosophy there, kind of creating, again, that conceptual framework to explain it. You may not be comfortable with that early on, especially if you don't know a lot of scripture and you don't understand the major themes of scripture, you're not going to be comfortable with that. So the third method is the one that I think is the most commonly used. And it's good. It's fine. Like, I think, this is, I think this is probably the best way for most people. It's called the experience method, and it's simply sharing your experience. See, somebody can argue with me all day long about philosophy and logic. They can argue with me about any of the other two methods. They can argue about scripture, right? And 
It's not that people can't argue about your experience, but inherently, if I share with you, this happened to me, you don't really have a right to argue with me about that. We, we all understand that as human beings, that if somebody is sharing their experience, what they claim happened to them, that it is rude or wrong to contradict them. Why? Because you didn't live their life. You weren't there. You don't know what did or didn't happen. Now, you may suspect they're lying. You may have your doubts, but you can't really defeat them with an argument. And so I think the best and most natural way to share your faith for most people is simply sharing your experience. You see examples of that all through Scripture. Um, so I would encourage you, if you don't know how to share your faith, just share your experience. You know, well, when I was a kid, I, I, I came to know Jesus. I, I asked Him to forgive my sins, and then I went forward and I was baptized. Well, well, what do you mean sin, right? That was what the person might be asking, right? Give them the opportunity to ask some questions. And by the way, with all three methods, for the literal love of the Lord, let the people ask questions. Don't railroad them, okay? Again, this is a conversation, not a sales pitch. So in that experience method, they're, they're going to naturally ask questions. You, at that point, do eventually need to be bold enough to say, do you want to be saved? And they'll probably say something like, what do I need to know? And that's where you can go, well, um, I, I know that I sinned against God and that I needed to trust Jesus to save me. That's enough. Now, if you want to do due diligence, you can look up the Roman road or the ABCs and look up the scriptures that go along with that. But guys, that's enough. It really is as simple as recognizing that you have offended God, believing that he's willing to cover your sins and take you to be with him in heaven. It is that simple. Everything else is information that helps us understand what's going on. But that's all that's strictly speaking necessary. So guys, well, and you know, obviously it's got to be centered in Jesus himself. Um, but other than that, that's, that's it, guys. So don't make it more complicated than it needs to be now that I've probably talked for 20 or 30 minutes. Um, but I wanted to share with you kind of three different ways of sharing the gospel and in doing that, hoping to flesh out what is the gospel. So in a nutshell, the gospel is simply this, that human beings, myself included, sinned against God. That God provided through Jesus a way to pay for that sin and bring us back into fellowship with Him for eternity. If I will trust Him, repent of my sins, which means turn away from my sins and trust Him, believe Him, ask Him for forgiveness, He will give it and I will be with Him forever in eternity. That's the gospel message in a nutshell. All right, guys, let me know any of your thoughts or questions. Um, again, don't forget to, to hit that subscribe button and make sure the bell icon is on. And also, don't, get, don't forget to give me a like if you appreciated this video. Guys, thank you so much, and God bless.